Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Garfunkel herself, Hi. Ricky Lindholm. Hello. Am I sitting here? Okay, back. That was clearly not from the special, but <laughs> that was from last season of Another Period. If you haven't seen it, it takes place in 1902. It's like a reality show set in 1902. So. And I that's know. all real stuff. It's based on all real stuff. That finger contraption is real from the turn of the century. It's, yeah, those are all Freud techniques, except for the bicycle. We're like, we have to, you know, add something to it. Yes so. and, of course. Yes, we had to yes and it, so we had the bike. Yeah. Oh, Ricky, you are really a renaissance woman. Uh, you are a actress, mm -hmm. a comedian, a musician. You Good. created another period. You were a writer on another period, the showrunner. Mm -hmm. Now we have a new special uh, coming this week. It was, I've been uh, busy. Kate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for making time and coming here to Google. I like try to tell my parents what I do all day. I'm just like, I don't know everything. I don't know just everything. And they're like, well, what do you, I'm like, it's always different. It's always, I don't know, I gotta go. And yeah, that's basically their understanding of my job. And you were here today without your cohort. You were here without Oates. I know, I'm so no sad. Kate today. She's in LA doing Conan today. Oh, oh so. I know. Here we are with yeah. Cliff, so I mean, so. <laughs> you drew the short straw, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so Garfunkel and Oates, mm -hmm. let's just start with what people need to know. Why Garfunkel? Well, I was at a uh, Hall and Oates concert at Hollywood Bowl, and I had really bad seats. I was, in the, it was like I was waitressing, I was in the back. And so basically you can only watch it on the monitors, and the camera had a close-up of Daryl that he kind of had like a wind machine kind of situation. It was a close-up of Daryl, and then it was like Oates in the band. So Oates was only in the wide shot, or like the moving right past him, and there was no two shot. It was just Daryl and then everyone else. And for some reason, that just made me laugh. And I was like, who set that up? Like, how does it feel to be Oates? And then, yeah, we kind of went from there. But we did realize about two years ago, someone sent us this like Simpsons thing where they had almost the same joke. Which were like, oh, they Simpsons had something called it. like, it was like Nash, Oates, and Garfunkel or something, but it was close enough where we were like, well, okay. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, too late now. <laughs> That's our name. So, uh, of course, uh, Kate is Oates, mm -hmm. you were Garfunkel. Yes. How did you guys get together? We were both auditioning for commercials, and neither of us were working because it was all kind of like Maxim Girls, like that Doritos Girl, if you guys remember, it was all like that kind of look. And then all of a sudden, they just started casting girls with big eyes. And so she and I just got called back for everything out of nowhere. Like, I got dropped by, I like auditioned for like a couple years, got dropped by my commercial agent, never booked anything. And then out of nowhere, like, Kate and I were just in all the commercials. We're like, what is happening? It didn't last that long, but we just kept seeing each other at callbacks. And then she came up and introduced me, introduced herself to me at UCB. And then we went from there. And how did the, uh, how the musician uh, kind of line get into it how did that well, we just became the like these weird soulmate friends like I, I don't even know how to explain it like Kate's boyfriend who was with her when we met like on the way home he's like you like her more than you like me and Kate says she remembers going like yeah you know so, <laughs> so yeah and then we found out that we both wrote comedy songs on our own I used to play them in college and Kate was kind of playing these comedy songs around town and I would play at parties like we'd been doing it on our own in an unofficial capacity for like 10 years and so then we're just like, oh, let's just do this together. Yeah. When was your first gig together? Um, gosh, when, I think it's been like eight years, maybe. Wow. It's been a long time, yeah. I think, yeah, I think it was 2008. We made this short that like Kate was my imaginary friend and it was a musical and we wrote the songs for it and just made it, yeah. Very cool. And kind of since then, yeah. Great. Uh, what is your song process like? Uh, I know the old creative process question, but... Well, basically, it's evolved because we've kind of like found out like our what we're good at and how to do it. So basically, we'll have a topic and then we just brainstorm on it forever. This is only the songs that make it. Like the songs that don't, I don't even know. They just like, we just throw them in the garbage. But basically, we brainstorm forever and we'll have like a 20-page document of anything we've ever thought about this topic. And then she gives it to me and I sort of like narrow it down and come up with a title. And then after I have the title, I go and do a first pass of the lyrics, give it to Kate. She does the first pass of the melody, and then we get together and sort of, you know, make it together. But she just has these, like, catchy melodies that are always in her head, so. So do you guys ever go in, like, a specific bit of, like, you want to, like, hit a joke, and then a song comes around that, or is um, it? Sometimes we'll get a title. If we, but, like, we, if, you, if, you, if there's not enough to sustain a joke for, like, three minutes, then we don't do it. Because, like, some things are good as one line, but then... Like, what do you say after that? You know, it's just like, I've got nothing left, so. A lot of, most things end up in the garbage because they don't, we can't, like, blow them out to a whole song. But. Well, now this leads to the very first special, Trying to be Special. Yes. And of course, uh, 
spoiler alert, I have seen it, so I'll try and keep it uh, <laughs> keep it close. But uh, yeah. the special is about trying to make a special. Yes, it is. So. It's very meta. It's basically Kate and I are um, like in a hotel room, and we had this gig that you think went really badly, and we're just like, this sucks. Like it's, that it was, we're so tired. We're on the, and, and I'm like, do you think we should do something different? And she's like, I don't know. And I'm like, well, we're we're 36 years old. We have no husbands, no real jobs, no kids. Like our lives are amazing. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, totally. Like the only thing that could make it better is a comedy special. And so we're like, oh, we don't have money to make a comedy special. So we do a fundraiser concert in order to make money to be able to put on a special. So and then you see you see the fundraiser concert. So, yeah. And this uh, this comes out this coming week on Cinco de Mayo. Cinco de Mayo, yes. Uh, May 5th. It's uh, available on Vimeo. Vimeo, yeah. So going the digital route. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we decided to do something different because Vimeo, is like, they have the best player. Like, they just do. Like, businesses use it. They're the best player. And you can just download it and have it on your computer forever. I'm like, that just, I don't know. It seemed like, and they don't give notes. They have full, you have full 100% creative control. So we were like, that kind of feels in the same budget as everywhere else. So we're kind of like, oh, no notes. And yeah, let's do that. So <laughs> that's what we decided to go with. Um, one thing in the special that we were talking about prior is just the, the quirkiness of your guys' characters. Yeah. And it makes everything seem so just spur of the moment. Right. And some of it is. Yeah. <laughs> some of it is. Like a lot we don't when we go on tour, we don't know what we're gonna talk about when we walk out. Unless we like some, unless something really weird happened right before. And we're like, okay, we're gonna talk about that. But usually we just walk out and like begin and sometimes it goes better than other times. <laughs> but and so you, you actually uh, said that you and Kate had, uh, she introduced herself at UCB, so yeah. improv background? No, or, no, we were there seeing a friend's show. Oh, well. We were seeing a Doug Benson show, and yeah, we were both friends with him. I made friends with him on Friendster. Oh, wow. That's real. <laughs> that is real. He saw some play that I was in and was like, your play is funny. And I was like, I just saw you do comedy. And then we were like loose acquaintances. And he was like, well, come to my next show. And that's where I met Kate. It's actually funny. I was first exposed to you guys from Doug Benson's podcast. Really? Yeah. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's been so nice to us since day one. He always has us on there. He's just like been a good friend to us. Yeah. yeah. He opened for us last time we were in LA just to be nice. Like, didn't want any money. He just like opened for us. It was, yeah, it was cool. All right, so just shifting over since we saw the Another Period clip to yes. start. Um, so Another Period is created and written by you and Natasha Legara. Mm -hmm. And you did say it's a it's like a reality show based in 1902. Yeah, so. we say if it's like if like a family like the Kardashians moved into Downton Abbey. So this is it's, it's set in America, it's set in Newport, Rhode Island. These people are not classy, they're new money, and they just they have unlimited money, but it's brand new. And our dad is a magnet magnate. He like owns all the magnets <laughs> in the world, I guess. <laughs> and, yeah. And then we just are like pieces of garbage that have no problems but complain all day long. So. And uh, under the periods, of course, on Comedy Central, uh, yes. season two comes out in June. June fifteenth. Great. Yep. June fifteenth, Comedy Central. Yeah. Um, how did that come about with you and Natasha? Was that just a conversation of so, imagine? So Natasha and I, we went to. Um, do, we went on like a charity trip to uh, Senegal for Malaria No More, it, which is actually an incredible organization. Like you have to, they're like actually curing malaria. Like they're actually doing stuff. It's so crazy. But I love that company. And we went to Senegal and it was just like, we just bonded. It's so hot. And we were just, we didn't know what we were doing. And it was, it was intense. And so we just became friends. And then kind of when we were flying back, Natasha was like, I looked at your IMDb and I'm like, yeah, <laughs> like, okay. She's like, no, I just, you have like 80 credits on there. And how many of those things have you been in that are actually funny? And I was like, I was like, that's a good question. I was like, I don't know, two? <laughs> and she's like, well, I have zero. I have like 50 things and zero things are funny. And she's like, I feel like that's weird. She's like, I think like we need to write stuff and make funny stuff because why is everything not funny? And I'm like, all right, good point. And so, we started trying to come up with an idea, and then we were like kind of stuck, and then so we went out and drank a bunch of wine, and then then, then came up with the idea, <laughs> as you do. Like, as you you're do. Like when you're like, fuck it, let's get wasted, and they're like, I know the idea. <laughs> like it's a terrible creative process, but it totally works. So, uh, speaking of your IMDb, actually, I, I found myself watching Million Dollar Baby recently, oh, and yeah. I was totally blindsided. And I was like, oh my god, yeah. Like, that's an intense. Uh, I'm a Renaissance woman, as you there say. There we go. That's right. Yeah, no, that was my first movie. It was so crazy. Oh, well. I just thought it was going up from there. No, I like, was like my first movie I was ever in one the Oscar, like, sky's the limit. And then I, like, still didn't get an agent for, like, another two or three years. <laughs> I was like, okay, so it's going to be slower. And, yeah. But it was really awesome. It was crazy. 
you. I'm like, my first name was the Clint Eastwood and Hilary Swank and Margot Martindale that I ever did. And I'm like, okay, it's fine. I'm fine. I totally deserve to be here. I just, you know. Well, congratulations on the best picture. Yeah, thank you, thank you. It really changed my life. <laughs> uh, just so you guys know, we will be taking questions from the audience. There are microphones in both the aisles. If you want to just go up there, I'll call on you and mm -hmm. do it like school. I feel like you have my back and you clap the hardest, so you have to ask me a question and get the ball rolling. I just, I, I sense your, like, I just, I like your whole energy, and it made me feel good as I was walking out here. I'm sold. So not to put you on the spot, but you have to think of something to ask me. <laughs> you can wait. Why don't you guys take a few minutes? Okay, okay. think I about it, and we'll get back to you, okay. <laughs> All right, uh, if I was in the audience, yeah. and I wasn't lucky enough to be moderating this, I would ask you a very important question. What? What is it like dating Fozzie Bear? It's pretty sexy. <laughs> it's like, yeah, he's he's pretty smooth. He's yeah. No, I actually loved I loved being on the Muppets. It I was a big Muppets fan. I know people like always say it. They're like, "I always loved The Flash." And it's like, "No, you didn't. No, you didn't. You didn't love that growing up, but I actually did love the Muppets. I would have Mrs. Miss P Mrs. Piggy. I'd have Miss Piggy birthday cakes and, you know, I just I I loved it. So it was pretty cool. I didn't know how it worked. I didn't know there was so many people controlling a Muppet. Or there's like monitors everywhere and you're on this like raised platform and it's it's pretty. Yeah, what is the process of like doing a scene with Fozzie? It's, there's just so many people involved. There's so many actors like making this thing come to life. There's like one guy that does the left arm and, when, and they're all working in this, like they just know each other so well and they have like these things on their heads where they can see through the, like it's just a whole technical process that they find very easy. And the guy who played Fozzie also does the voice of Piggy and Animal. Oh, wow. So that's like his talent is basically unlimited. <laughs> he does all three of those. So, yeah. What do you uh, got? <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> I'm ready. Uh, so I guess, first of all, on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for coming. Uh, Thanks I'm for having me. a huge fan and have been for years. I, I like to feel that your song, I Don't Know Who You Are, is my own personal anthem. I know, you know right? I'm, I'm terrible with names and faces, and it's really your fault. Yeah. <laughs> don't you think, for people who don't know what this is, we have a song about, um, it's called I Don't Know Who You Are, which you can figure out what that is, but it's people who come up to you and they know who you are, but you don't know who they are, and they get mad. And we have this like hypothesis that it's like, their fault because they're not interesting enough they sure. don't have like a thing and so Face they kind of tattoo. blend and then it's not our fault sure yeah uh so that's amazing so thank you yeah. so much uh for for uh, opening up my life like yeah. that and, and all that <laughs> um, So uh, I discovered you guys are amazing, Garfunkel Notes. There's another a comedy folk duo I'm sure you've heard of called Flight of the Concords. Yes. And it seems such an odd thing to me that there were two comedy folk duos that were so hysterically funny, had really successful songwriting careers, mm -hmm. and then made specials where they incorporated those songs. Yeah. Were you guys inspired by each other? Do you collaborate? Do you totally. guys all hang out in some really cool bar somewhere? Um, where is this bar? I've never met Brett, but I know Jim Jermaine, and Jermaine is actually on the upcoming season of Another Period. He's doing two episodes this season, which is so cool. He flew in from New Zealand just to do the show, and he, he plays a priest. It's like it's like every single thing he says is funny, so we were very, very excited. But Jermaine and I actually became friends on Twitter. Like he just sent me a DM one day being like, hey, there's like eight people in the world who do what we do. What's up? And I was like, I know, it's so crazy, right? And he was like, how weird is it? We're doing, we're doing, we're in comedy folk, like who does this? I'm like, I don't know. And then we just have been like Twitter acquaintances since then and then he agreed to do the show, which was so cool. So no plans for some grand mega band or something? I mean, I would be so down. Comedy folk quartet? I, don't I know. mean, I, I wish, I hope. I'm gonna put up, I don't know Brett, but I would love to, just putting it out. In now it's out in the world. world. Yeah, it's, it's in the universe now, it's gonna happen. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, buddy. But that, that I Don't Know Who You Are song was really weird because everyone like takes your point of view, which is like, I don't remember people either. You know, you put yourself in the hero position, but when one person came up to us after a show and they're like, that song is so mean. And I was like, wait, why? Like, what? He goes, people always forget me. <laughs> and I was like, oh God. And he put, he put himself in the other, like, don't you always put yourself in like the hero shoes? Like you hear a bit about other people being annoying, but like, I am annoyed. Like you don't put your, I don't know. I thought that was so strange and I didn't know what to say. I was like, I think you should not, you should like, like change your perspective on this. Like, do you forget people? And he's like, not really. <laughs> like, Sorry, man, I don't know. But, uh, speaking of that, another one of your songs seems like it may come across as aggressive to people, pregnant women are smug. Have you right. ever had any of backlash from that? I mean, yeah, but not any that like you care about. Like, you know, I don't know. Sure. Like, what's the, what are you gonna, oh, you know? Like, I don't like that. I'm like, 
because okay. they're smug. Right. Like it doesn't it doesn't ever hurt my feelings ever. But like so many more people have been like like Amanda Palmer is pregnant. She she's saying pregnant women are smug on her whole tour. Like she's like took it on. And a lot of people like we got these onesies made that say my mommy is smug and they just like sold out. People just people just buy them. So I think probably for gag gifts for baby showers. But I think I don't know. Most people own it. I feel like if you're pregnant and acting like that, like you know it. And like you can, like you're allowed to. There's no yeah, you're just allowed to do that, but I think you know it. The woman card. The woman card, I know. <laughs> the pregnant woman card. That's that's more powerful than the woman card, I think. Because sure. like because no one can say that you're not going through whatever you say you're going through. Like, like no, my, my ankles hurt. And you're like, OK. Like, you can't, you can't be like, no, they don't. You have no idea. Yeah. Uh, speaking of your songs, I want to, uh, I'm dating a 31-year-old woman who loves 29, 31. Oh, cool. So uh, thank you for that from her. Does she feel like there's no one left, and that's uh, why she's dating you? Maybe. <laughs> no, I'm totally sure. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly what I said when she was like, oh, man, that's so cool. And I was just like, wait a second. This, this got really real. It's so funny when people take that, like, so, some people have taken it seriously. Like, I was at a baseball game the other day, and this girl turns on. She's like, are you the girl from the 2931 video? And I was like, yeah, yeah. And she didn't think we wrote it. She thought we were, like, acting in this video. And she's like, I relate to that song so much. I'm 30, and I know my life is about to get really bad. And I was like, no, it's just a joke. It's not even, like, it's not real, like, it's not necessarily that it's just like a joke. It was about like basically me and Kate's kind of perspectives on love and we weren't even 29 and 31 at the time. We just thought those were funny numbers. We were like 31 and 33, but we're like, eh, that's not as funny. Um, yeah, but she's like, I just know everything's gonna get bad and I gotta meet someone soon. And she was so pretty and like, I was, I'm like, okay. I'm like, sorry, you, maybe you shouldn't watch that video. <laughs> it's like just a joke. <laughs> uh, that said, uh, out of all of the songs you and Kate have put together, mm -hmm. what is like your go-to like, which, of, which is your favorite baby, basically? What's your favorite? My favorite song is one that we've actually never played. On, it's just on an album, but it's on our TV show. It's called Such a Loser. And it's this anthem for people who are trying. Because, like, we, like, just like, I, I mean, you guys are all on the internet. You understand, like, when you put something out there, you just get all this criticism. And, and it kind of feels like there's, like, this hierarchy where it's, like, winners, like, people who just don't do anything but, like, comment on it, and then losers. But, like, we just feel like those should be switched. Like, winners are just, like, they won. You got it. Like, they did. But, like, the people who try and the people who comment on it should be, like, a different hierarchy. So that the commenters should just be, like, whatever. And so we wrote a song about in praise of people who are trying and failing. Because if you're failing that much, you're trying that much. So it's, it's not a funny song. It's totally sentimental. But I think it's the best thing we've ever written. So, yeah, look it up. Great. We have like a cartoon made of it, and people play it for their kids. Uh, with the with your songwriting process, you seem to then also go into video. Uh, so, what is that like? Do you ever like get kind of bogged down and like, oh, this would look great visually, so we should add it to the song, no. or is that well after the fact? Nope, we don't have that kind of forethought. <laughs> We're just like, oh, I don't know. I guess we just film some stuff. Yeah, we don't really ever think about that part of the song. And like for such a loser, we had it animated by these people in Boston who are so incredible. And they just sent us this thing, and Kate and I, we always have a million notes. We're always, we're so nitpicky, it takes us forever to do anything. And they sent it, and we just started crying, both of us. And we're like, this is perfect. And they were like, well, we have like four rounds of notes built in. And we're like, no. <laughs> so sometimes it's like that easy. I was going to say, so for you, notes are really a bad thing in uh, general. No, no, no. I always have so many notes. But this one, it was just like, it was perfect. And so you don't want to, if it's perfect, it's perfect. You know, so. But yeah, I'm pretty. I'm like pretty hands-on with everything. Okay. I like to be in every moment of everything. Like Natasha and I are editing another period right now, and we're in the editing room from like 10 to 8 every single day. We just get our nails done in there. <laughs> we like, do, yeah. We're hands-on. Great. Um, in another period. Um, sorry, I thought I was going to say. Uh, uh, in another period uh, coming up. Yeah. What can we look forward to? You mentioned that Jermaine well, is going to be Jermaine on. Well, Jermaine and Andrew Reynolds is on this new season, playing like a dashing prince type person. We have um, Harriet Tubman is in our premiere, <laughs> and which is so crazy that now she's on Money, well, about to be on Money, um, because we have her as a, she's a branding expert. We have her as like this Oprah type person, and she's basically like, how do you think I'm the only name associated with this entire movement? She's like, I did that shit, like on our show. People are gonna have mixed reactions to it, they really are, and we're prepared for that. But it is funny if you watch it, it's just like, it's, 
you know, because you think about, you're like, how did one person, how did that happen? Like, there was so many people, but yes, yeah, so you just think through history, and yeah, and now she's going to be on money, so I guess it worked. In that vein, uh, you mentioned earlier that a lot of things are from 1902, and then you yes and Yes. Um, so much stuff is true, though. So th people think we make up this stuff, and it's like, like, we have, like, cocaine wine. Like, that was just a popular drink. That was not, we didn't make that up. People had cocaine wine all the time. It's just, those kind of things are just real. Freud masturbating people, it's just real. So that's a real, uh, a real clip entirely with Freud. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was not Chris Parnell. <laughs> that was Sigmund Freud. All right, great. Um, thank you so much for being here. We really Thanks appreciate it. Uh, if anyone fun. would like to meet Ricky afterwards, we'll be right here. I'm right here. Yeah. <laughs> and if you didn't want to ask your questions directly, I mean, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for everyone having Ricky me. Ricky Lino. Thank you, guys.